Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for this special Mount Vernon live stream. I'm Jim Ambusky. I lead the Center for Digital History at the Washington Library, where I also host the podcast Conversations at the Washington Library, which you can find wherever you get your favorite podcasts. As you may know, Mount Vernon and the Washington Library are currently closed to the public due to the coronavirus, but the team is working very hard to bring Mount Vernon and its educational mission to you through our digital initiatives. In addition to tonight's live event, we're hosting daily live streams on weekdays at noon on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And we have created two web pages that will help keep you, your students, and your family learning during this time. Check out our collection of resources at www.mountvernon.org slash digital or slash online learning. Tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by New York Times bestselling author Alexis Coe, whose new book, You Never Forget Your First, a biography of George Washington, is a fresh take on a founding father, and he may not appear quite as you remember him. Alexis and I will be talking about her book and more specifically the many diseases that Washington confronted during his lifetime, including the final illness that claimed his life in 1799. Folks out there should feel free to submit questions through Facebook or YouTube. We'll try to tackle as many as we can in the second half of the show. And if you'd like to purchase your own copy of Alexis's book, please do so by clicking on the link appearing on your screen. Your purchase will help support Mount Vernon during this difficult time. Alexis, thanks so much for joining me this evening. I'm really looking forward to our time together. Thanks for having me. I was uh, very fortunate to have you on the podcast the day your book launched in February. Uh, I'm glad that people can now see us uh, in ways that they could not last time and when they were just listening to us. And I imagine, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna have as much fun as we did then uh, now as we as we did then, you know, despite uh, sometimes the morbid subject matter. But um, your book uh, quickly became a New York Times bestseller. Uh, you launched a national book tour. And can you give us a sense of, of what the reception has been like to your work? I mean, it's been incredible. I had hoped um, to satisfy experts, my peers, my historian colleagues, and also attract a fair amount of new readers, people who were um, not well versed in early America and certainly not Washington. And to see just the array of um, people who had come to readings, who were posting about the book online, it's been incredible. And also something totally unexpected, um, is that people are using the book to have sort of tough conversations mm -hmm. about politics. So at Mer Mount Vernon um, in particular, I saw a lot of um, folks from Virginia who come to Mount Vernon a lot and they bought either one copy for an adult child or a family member, um, or, you know, it, it was just incredible like to, mm -hmm. to, to hear about it. And I've heard about it from the other vantage point too. So mm -hmm. kids who are discussing it with their parents that's been great, but also to hear um, academics use the term Simon of dad <laughs> history has been incredible, particularly because I never even thought that would make it into the book. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it adds levity to mm -hmm. the subject in a way that's really important, um, particularly for Washington studies. I think that if you can disarm people, you can have a little bit of fun and you can make everyone feel like they're an expert that, um, everyone wins. So you were trying to appeal to a broad based audience with this work, not just simply historians or people who knew a lot about Washington, but trying to cover a wider canvas. And sort of satisfy everyone, which was, mm -hmm. you know, um, an incredible goal. And I'm sure that there are plenty of dissatisfied people, but <laughs> the ones that I've heard from, they made it a bestseller and that's, that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Well, I do want to pick up uh, on something you said just a moment ago about the thigh men of, of of dad history. And we talked about that on the podcast and I even used that in the title for our podcast episode. So yeah. if folks want to get into that a little bit more, please do check that out. But could you just give us a brief, a brief primer on what you mean? Because that does speak to our subject tonight, which is really Washington's body uh, and, and mm -hmm. disease in, in the 18th century. Yes. Washington studies, um, there are amazing variety of books. But when it comes to biography, meaning, you know, cradle to casket, you know, all encompassing books, 
they do tend to be written by men mm -hmm. in the last hundred years. I'm the third woman. If you're going by, you know, a, a historian, as far as like someone who is trained and practices in this way, then I'm the first. And what that means is what it means when there's a lack of diversity in any field, which is that, you know, people tend to, to take the same route. They, they have the same experiences, so they can't sort of see other things. Um, and I think as Annette Gordon-Reed famously showed us in Jefferson studies, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, we don't always know what we think we know. Um, and actually I have three of my favorite books right here oh, by goodness. women who have written about Washington, not biographies, because again, there just haven't been that many, but no biography, um, you know, in the last 40 years could have been written without Mary V. Thompson, um, who has written this book, um, The Only Unavoidable Subject of Regret on Slavery, um, Never Caught, Erica Dunbar was the sort of first woman to really like invigorate, um, reinvigorate Washington studies. Mm -hmm. And then The Widow Washington by Martha Saxton. Um, this book did not come out by the time that my first draft was due, but she was lovely. And we had a lot of um, conversations on the phone and exchanged emails. So I feel like she really influenced it as well. But to his size, one of the things I noticed was they talked a lot, his male biographers, a lot about his body. And his, his body was incredible, um, but it wasn't, uh, it was, it was sort of like more of a genuflecting thing. It was uh -huh. more about the aesthetics of it and a sort of admiration. Um, you know, they start with his thighs and then turn all sort of goes to like a rippling jaw. It's really the stuff of romance novels. And, um, and so I began to think of them as the thigh men of dad history, but I had that in like brackets and lower cases mm -hmm. and um, all my second readers kept taking it out and, and making it, you know, a phrase like, capital T, capital M, um, and then it stuck. And if the the media coverage is um, emblematic of, of a, a reaction to it, it seems it was it was a big thing. It's well, a big part of the book for them. Certainly caught on. And that's, that's a good uh, example of, of uh, having good editors to help you see something that, uh, as you I think you said before, you sort of started out as a joke, but then actually became something integral to the book itself. Yeah, and and it and it definitely conveys so much that I wanted. And actually, the title of the book started out that way too. It was just a joke um, mm -hmm. because people tend to name the same things about Washington. All, you know, often myths. And if you tell them they can't name those things, they're sort of like, uh, I don't, general, <laughs> president. And so um, this was just a working title as a, a joke to sort of get people to understand why we needed another Washington biography immediately without having mm -hmm. to sort of explain it and give them my whole elevator pitch. It worked and then it stuck. That totally makes sense. Well, and I certainly agree with you uh, uh, about the three authors you named, particularly Mary Thompson. I'm very fortunate to work with Mary every day, and she has an encyclopedic mind that we have to somehow figure out how to download uh, because she, you know, I think uh, I saw you say the other day that she's probably one of the greatest living Washington scholars uh, working today, and I can certainly attest to that because every time I have a question that is seemingly obscure somehow she knows the answer to that question and in good cheer she's a lot of fun she's one of my favorite people to email with and this is you know a, a few years strong now certainly certainly well uh, you were on your book tour and unfortunately that got cut short because of the COVID-19 outbreak and the and the pandemic and the subsequent uh, shelter in place orders um, before we move on actually I just want to check in with you to see how you and your family are doing uh, and how things are in New York right now an interesting thing, right, to be a historian and be living through historic times. There mm -hmm. have been moments, I would say, in my life that have, that have been historic moments, but this is, you know, unprecedented. Um, we're fine. It uh, We're on day, I think, 16 of um, quarantine, and uh, my husband and my um, almost 10-month-old baby <laughs> are all here without childcare or working. So it's yeah. been um, challenging. It's also been fun. And um, as long as we don't need anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the minute we need something like toilet paper, milk, um, then it becomes a little bit more difficult because there mm -hmm. are lines around the block. But it sounds like everyone is, is experiencing their own sort of regional challenges. And the mm -hmm. most important thing is that we just do what we've been doing, which is stay inside to help our community and keep everyone safe. So small. Uh, like I would say small, uncomfortable moments, but for the most part, we're so, we're like so fortunate to be healthy and to have homes and paychecks. And 
time well, together. Exactly. Well, that's really good to hear. Yeah, we uh, we here in Virginia, we uh, we just came under a, a shelter in place order yesterday. So not much different than uh, yeah. what we had been doing previously. Um, you know, unfortunately, some people were not taking it seriously and still going to the beach. And so I think that prompted the order. But uh, like you said, we're trying our best just to make sure that, um, you know, we take care of the community by doing what we need to do. Um, and, you know, dealing with any hardships at, in the present moment. One of the great things, though, I guess if there is a silver lining at this whole whole moment is that, you know, we're seeing book sales surge and that people are using the time that they have to uh, uh, sharpen the old brain and, and catch up on some of the books uh, that they've always wanted to. And it seems like folks are, are getting, you never forget your first. We, we've talked a little bit about um, your sense of what previous biographers had done with Washington, but before we, we get into the uh, tonight's main event, I wonder if you might speak to why Washington himself was a, was a subject of interest for you. I love presidential biographies, and I hosted a podcast um, for Audible, which is on hiatus, so I guess they still host it, called Presidents Are People mm -hmm. Too, and uh -huh. we um, each episode is on a president, and I would often read like three or four biographies in, com in conversation. It's a habit that I started in grad school when it was someone I couldn't concentrate on, you know, I couldn't spend years on, but I wanted to, to feel like I was grounded in mm -hmm. the person. And um, usually by the end of that time, I felt as if I knew them really well. But I think because of the um, the sort of, you know, the lack of diversity in Washington biographies, that they seem to follow all the same steps, that they sort of covered the same material with some variations. But um, I never felt closer to him at the end. I, I always felt like so much more removed, um, which was strange. Sure. And, um, you know, so eventually I started checking primary sources and found that things like didn't quite match up, that some people had just repeated others because they were all interested in kind of the same things. And um, I wanted to present Washington the way micro histories do. So the way like never caught or the mm -hmm. um, only unavoidable subject of regret, meaning that they talk about a specific thing like slavery, um, but they seem to all always like give you the full history too sure. without being a thousand pages and it's really it's really masterful you know you pick you don't show every example that you research in order to say like i i looked at everything i spent years on it but you pick like the perfect two or three that's incredible mm -hmm. um and so i sort of signed my myself up for this this challenge and um and it and it's been great. And I do at the end of it, he was a real person to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was great to hear from Washington scholars, um, particularly scholars at the at the George Washington papers at UVA, my fact checker, Bill Ferraro, who you've worked with, um, yeah. to hear that like job well done. He's he's a wonderful man, but he doesn't like compliments not coming out all the time. So to hear that like he thought that I had accomplished it, that was maybe the highest praise I've ever received in my life. Mm -hmm. Well, and would you mind just uh, speaking about the person who made your very excellent book cover? Yes, um, I wanted an original. So one of the issues that I have besides um, the fixation on his body and in particular his thighs is I feel like presidential biographies in general, so this is a big complaint. This isn't just about, um, I've got a lot of complaints. This isn't just about Washington, that sure. they tend to have um, a formulaic uh, title and sort of, you know, I could guess which portrait is on the cover. Um, and so mm -hmm. I really wanted, you know, a fun, you know, title, um, inadvertent or not. And I, uh, I wanted an original portrait and I wanted something that was a little bit, um, it, it, it had, Washington wasn't in his um, uniform, which he often is. I wanted him mm -hmm. to be wearing something sumptuous that's sort of like low key, how we imagine, um, you know, he would have dressed on a on a Sunday or in the evening when he was receiving people maybe in New York or in Philadelphia, the mm -hmm. first um, sites of the president's house. Um, and so, I, and I also wanted um, a woman to paint it who was sort of unexpected and so, um, Viking was up to the challenge and they, you know, scoured Instagram and they found another Alexis, uh, Alexis Franklin, and she made 
this incredible portrait. And we had different iterations at one point, there was like a flag, there were other things. And um, in the end, for the sort of cheekiness, uh, this just worked. I did want the Washington, I'll, I'll admit, I wanted the Washington Monument in his hand. And it was a late, the late moment of genius, only if it had come sooner, maybe. But I'm happy, I'm really, yeah. really happy. Which <laughs> well, is maybe. So, so unusual for, um, you know, for a book author. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you just are stuck with what you get, but it really worked out this time. They trusted me. So I yeah. hope I made them <laughs> feel like it was worth it. I'm sure you have. Well, as we, we've been talking about, you know, one of the things that you are particularly interested in is Washington's body. And a lot of our viewers might not know or realize that for historians, the body itself can actually be a way that we help explain a person's life, you know, just like digging into letters or reconstructing the library that they own. The, the body can tell us quite a bit about who this person was, what their life was like and how they, what their relationships were with other people. So, I mean, what, what does fascinate you about Washington's body? His body is amazing because of what it endured. So take a step back for a moment and um, let's think about Washington's family, his mother, sure. Mary, who he seems to have taken um, after physically and in a lot of other ways. She was very strong and she lived, um, I believe, into her late 70s, maybe even 80s. And she um, that was unusual for the yeah. period. Um, Washington's family, they seem to die young as far as the men in his family mm -hmm. and um, 40s seemed to be the limit, the upper limit. And so Washington did sort of live in this way that um, I wouldn't say he was reckless, but he sort of, you know, he accepted providence. He always said that like, basically whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. He's going to go through life responsibly. I, I say that sort of as he gets older, more responsibly, yeah. of course, as everyone, as we all do. Um, but <laughs> he was also sort of accepting of what would happen. Um, and so he, he he did quarantine when things happened when mm -hmm. when outbreaks happened we we want to say that but sure. um you know major outbreaks were not the only concern of people in the 18th century they of course were um scared of diseases and, and i would be just as scared of doctors um which many of them were because yes. the doctors were doing the best that they could as we would say today you're doing amazing sweetie but they had very little information to go on and they they went with it. I mean, they just went with it. Um, sure. And they were also, you know, they were, this wasn't, they didn't go to medical school and then they didn't do residencies. These weren't like the amazing people we see right now risking their lives in hospitals and in Central Park and makeshift mm -hmm. hospitals and on boats. They are sometimes barbers and overseers and they have day jobs and this is just one of them. Um, and so that's really something that, that we have to think about with his mindset. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, as an organizing tool, um, I just sort of was overwhelmed by how many times, for example, he had dysentery. And I started to list all of these things and eventually realized, you know, I could I could spend 50 pages telling you he was um, he moved with the grace of an athlete. True. I can tell you about sure. how many times he endured dysentery. I can tell you on page 12 and 47 and 72 and 112 and so on, but that's really not going to do it for you because you're reading a whole lot of things in between. Why don't I tell you those things, but also just give you a really handy list. And when you also are, um, you know, getting a little fatigued as we all do when we read, not my book, but other books, you know, sometimes we get fatigued that uh, it would be nice to have like a listicle. And it's okay to say we read books and we read articles. And we also now in, you know, the year of our Lord 2020, we read listicles. Yeah. And um, one of the ones that I was most excited about, and I wanted you to, again, to feel like an expert. So there are other ones too. And I think um, this one's really fun. It's about his, you know, likes and dislikes, sort of Washington's glance and um, dislike oh, yeah. idle chatter sitting for portraits 100%. Those letters are amazing. Um, <laughs> inherited titles, uh, you know, that's a thing. Um, wasted opportunity, procrastination, political parties, but we're not gonna go there. We're here, about, we're here to talk about diseases. Um, exactly. And I think this, all, <laughs> this also is just, um, you know, Washington, the fact that he made it to 1799, the fact that he lived 
for that long, considering that he fought in the revolution, that he was public enemy mm -hmm. number one, that he also, remember, fought for the British, and thank goodness they didn't give him what he wanted, or else we might mm -hmm. we might be British subjects. Um, but he, just from the youngest age, and so the first, the first, I mean, he had different things. And this isn't like a JFK, I'm bedridden from age two, and this is, I'm going to be like quiet about it for the rest of my life. This is just Washington. Right getting something, enduring it, trying to recover, maybe having some scars and just and just going. So the first thing happens when he's 15, mm -hmm. first case of dysentery. And just to step back, it's a rough time on, you know, on Ferry Farm. Things are mm -hmm. really dire. Mary Washington is um, at this point a widow and she's a woman in early America who mm -hmm. um, is trying to, protect her family and raise all these kids and 